All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's um session. To the welcome to this Inside Identity 8.0 session. I'm your host for the morning. My name is Kelechin Joku. I am deputy news editor here at Tech Cabal. And today we will be discussing data sharing and financial inclusion, balancing collaboration and sovereignty. Data sharing and financial inclusion balancing collaboration and sovereignty. Very interesting topic, Very, um, a very highly packed um, topic. So now this session is brought to you by Tech Cabal and Core Identity. Now, in, now Core Ident Inside Identity, formerly Digital Identity Matters, is a webinar series powered by Core Identity, a digital identity platform that makes it easier for businesses to connect to trusted identities and critical consumer analytics. The platform provides API infrastructure access and consumer insights to commercial and digital banks, fintechs, lenders, insurance, telcos, and utilities for onboarding, sales, and compliance. And Tech Cabal and TC Insights, um, we are an Africa-focused digital economy consultancy that leverages big data to help startups, investors, operators, big tech companies, government, and other ecosystem players on and off the continent to answer specific questions and implement key interventions. Now, this um, conversation is, um, this session is going to go in a very simple, um, it's going to follow a very simple structure. We're going to first start with a 40 minute conversation with my speakers here. And then after that, we're going to have a Q and A. So while the conversation is going on for everyone in the chat room, please just feel free to drop your questions in the chat box and I'll get to them in the Q&A um, session. Now, the chat room will be moderated by Eniola Soshon, who is our event officer at Tech Cabal Insights. She's moderating the chat room today. Um, so before we get into the conversation um, proper, I will hand over the mic to Ngonya Kalango, who is head of sales for the West Africa region of Core ID, for some opening remarks. Ngonya. All right. Um, Ngonya is probably going to join us later and mm -hmm. um, talk to us about um, Core ID and Core ID's products. So we're just going to get into the conversation and I hope everyone is excited for us to begin. But before that, let me talk about our speakers on the call for a bit. Um, the first person here is Isigi Agwili. Um, Isigi is the co-founder and CEO of Verify Me Nigeria. He's responsible, he's responsible for meeting the company's vision and mission and strategic plan for growth. He's an enterprise architect, engineer, and operations expert with experience in building fintech products and leading public sector business transformation programs. He's also seasoned in systems engineering, enterprise and solutions architecture, and business transformation and development. Um, welcome, Isige. And my next um, speaker is Adedeji Olowe. Adedeji is the founder of Lend SQ the loan infrastructure fintech powering lenders at scale. Beyond the, before this, he led Triumph Limited, the corporate VC of the Coronation Group, which invested in Woven Finance, Sparkle Bank, Clean, and Light, among others. He has almost two decades of banking experience, including stints as the divisional head of electronic banking at Fidelity Bank. He drove the turnaround of the bank's digital business he was previously responsible for UBA's payment card business across 19 countries. Alongside other industry veterans, he founded Open Bank in Nigeria, the nonprofit driving the development and adoption of a common API standard for the Nigerian financial industry. And beyond Open a a AIs, Adedeji works deeply within the fintech ecosystem. He's the board chairman at Paystack. Adedeji is a re renowned fintech pundit and has been blogging on technology and payments at digioloe.com since 2001. Welcome, Adidiji. Um, Saruni Maina is our third speaker for the morning. Saruni is currently the Associate Vice President of Stablecoins at Flutterwave. Saruni Maina is a 
product builder com business developer with a strong background in growing fintech products and B2B partnerships. And our final speaker is Ilamosi Ekenimo, who is a data product protection expert. Um, Ilamosi Ekenimo is a privacy expert with a multifunctional background in law and legal research, public policy, and human rights advocacy. She's an inaugural fellow of the Fratelli Tutti Political School and the Nigerian School of Internet Governance. She currently manages the SSC region within the privacy team of a multinational technology conglomerate. Prior to this role, Ilamosi worked primarily as a lawyer, advising a cohort of startups across Africa, as well as several multinational tech companies on data product protection and privacy within the continent. She also contributed to the drafting of the Nigerian Startup Act, which is the first subject matter specific legislation on startups in Nigeria. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome Ilamusi Saruni Esigye Adediji. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so, um, like I said at the beginning of this session, we are going to have a conversation for 40 minutes, uninterrupted and unbroken, and I'm really, really excited to get into it. And I'm just going to start with a very foundational question here, and I I want to hear um, Isigi's thoughts on, on this. So, my first question is really, um, so how has digital identity evolved in Africa over the past decade and what key factors have influenced this evolution? Sorry about that, I was on mute. Um, so yeah, interesting one. So first I would say that um, digital identity has kind of evolved um, differently depending on the region in Africa. Um, so if you take, for example, West Africa, uh, you know, I would say that one of the ways, and Nigeria, which is obviously, is obviously a big chunk of chunk of that, um, I would say that digital identity has, the way it's evolved, um, or the significant way that's a benefit is that today, you can actually verify anybody's identity um, instantly, you know, across many African countries. Now, um, the way it's evolved, you know, behind the scenes um, is that um, one of the drivers has been the need to implement payments, you know, across um, I would say, you know, our different countries. Um, we know if, when we look at the technology stack that the key enabler for payments is identity. Um, and so in Nigeria, for example, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I think it was BVN. So two differences over the last 10 years is that, um, you know, BVN is now kind of like the authoritative source for, you know, fintech, while NIN remains the, is now, or government is now the authoritative source for, um, I would say, security and services. Um, so we have, you know, two, I would say, uh, competing identities. That's the first one. Um, but, you know, the benefit is that you can uh, verify either um, instantly today. And that's a big change that has happened over the past 10 years, for sure. Yeah, thank you, um, Isigye. Um, Adedeji, what do you think? Oh, so like like uh, as you mentioned, identity is becoming critical because payment is the primary driver. And I think for most people, or uh, for the identity we have, they kind of push by those who wanted to make sure payment can drive itself very well. But the only sad part is that payment is still the only thing we are using identity for. It hasn't still been woven into the everyday fabric. When I mean everyday fabric is, even if you come to Shumai shop to buy something, do I know who you are, right? If you want to rent my house, do I know who you are? If I want to employ you, do I know who you are? We still don't depend on those identities today. Uh, so it means that um, data identity has to go beyond the realm of payments because payment is just one facet of life. It's just one part of life. When everything's woven together, I think people will take identity very well because can pay me electronically, I can pay me cash and it's fine, right? So it means that if I misbehave, I could do something somewhere else, right? And nobody will catch me. Now, if identity, identity is now woven into everyday thing, it means that if I mess up in payment, I can't get on the next bus. I can't buy some things. I think maybe at that time we say we've gotten to the level of uh, the level we want to be. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so my next question is um, for you, Elamosi. 
Um, you are a data um, privacy and protection expert, and I really want to get your thoughts on this. So can you talk to me about the specific challenges operators face when trying to strike a balance between data collection, data sharing, individual data sovereignty, regulatory compliance, and the goal of fostering financial inclusion in the context of Africa's digital ID system? Thank you, Kirichi. That's a very I long question. <laughs> yeah. But I'll do, my, I'll do my best to answer it. So I think that a few of the challenges, and I'm just going to run through them very quickly. I think the first challenge for any uh, major player in the financial space, in the fintech space in Africa generally, is a variance in our data protection laws. Um, we we have 54 different countries, and I think out of the 54, only 35 have data protection laws, and all of them have their own peculiarities. So while in other regions, for example, if in, in Europe, we have the GDPR, which is one legislation. In the US, we also have one legislation that everybody can modify accordingly. So in the different regions, there are key legislations that form the core of data protection within those regions. In Africa, we don't have that. So we have a few documents. We have, for example, the Malabo Convention, but we don't have any sole document that regulates data protection. That, that's the, the core, the grounding thing for data protection in Africa. So the first challenge that you're going to face is the variance in data protection laws. Compliance in Nigeria is different from compliance in Ghana, in Kenya, in South Africa. So I think that's the first, the first problem anybody's going to face. Um, the second problem I think is that there is um, a lack of harmony or a lack of harmonization between regulators um, within the space. So for example, for example, in Nigeria today, um, the CBN could make a regulation that has data protection provisions, which might be contrary to the Data Protection Act, and the NDPC, which is the National Data Protection Commission, could make its own regulations that might be contrary to what CBN has already provided for. So we always, and we, we know the infamous battle between the CBN and SEC, that's, that's, I think, is still ongoing. So there's the lack of harmony, there's the variance in laws between regulators, um, just, just for them to agree on you know, the specifics. I think those are those are two big challenges that, that operators in the space will face um, in trying to foster financial inclusion as hmm. regards their protection, yeah. Right, thank you very much. So I want to stay on that for a bit, you know, the part where you talked about, you know, regional or continent-wide um, data protection laws, right? So we have um, something that works for Europe, we have something that works for, for the US. Um, so are you saying that, are you, are you saying that's the only way or perhaps the more the more practical way, given the circumstances we are in, for data protection laws to work is if they cover these wide, you know, continent-based um regions. Like if we can have different data protection laws unifying different continents, why can't we just have them for different why can't different countries just have their own data protection laws? Yeah. So, and thank you for that question. I don't think that there has to be one law that like, everybody has to adopt, but some harmony would be good. So if there was harmony on basic principles, for example, just to put it, just to bring everybody into, into the conversation, um, banking, international banking, if you wanted to transfer money across borders, that would inf involve some sort of information transfer across borders. So in, in data protection, those are called cross-border data flows, right? Or cross-border data transfers, how you transfer data across countries or across borders. The laws that govern that in the different states are in the different countries rather in Africa are very different. So all the laws don't have to be the same. But if there was some harmonization whereby key provisions were the same or very similar. So, for example, you might say, OK, to transfer data across borders, we have to we have to meet these five basic criteria. You can have additional criteria. You can maybe take away and have only four or three criteria. But if you had those basic things, then everybody knows, okay, in our laws, we have to put these five basic things there at least at a minimum. And if you're going to exclude one of them, you have a good reason for doing so. In that way, when um, actors are coming into the space in Africa, then they know that, okay, if I have these five basic things, I'm good to go. In some places, in some other countries, there might be some peculiarities I have to adjust to, but I don't have to change my model of operation, my business model every single time I move to a new African country. So I think just some harmonization would be good, ideally through one document. But if that's not possible, it would be nice just to have, you know, a similar thread across all the laws in Africa so that people know what to expect. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Saruni, um, Ilamosi has spoken quite um, well about regulations and how, and you know, how it's important for there to be some harmony 
in all the, in in regulations across regions, whether these regions are whether we're looking at these regions on a continental basis or more fragmented in um, a country um, based um, basis. And I want to get your opinion about you know the significant regulatory considerations that operators need to keep in mind when working with digital identity systems in Africa. What what should they pay attention to? So first of all, I just have to completely agree with what Lamosi said. You know, uh, the biggest challenge that we face within the continent is that Africa is not a country. Now we always hear the statement that someone says, "Oh, I went to Africa," and we always say to them, "No, Africa is not a country." But I really think when it comes to regulation, for things to really work, we kind of have to operate like a country because that's what we've seen, especially the European side do, and things have really worked for them because it's it's really such a headache that if you want to do X in Kenya. You cannot really copy paste that in Nigeria or Uganda or Ghana because you're going to be met with different regulations. So that's, I just wanted to echo that and say that that is totally what I would have actually said as well. And then now when it comes to, uh, so here, here it is. Um, I think data protection, storage and data sharing is one of the most important aspects to look into. Um, for any of the operators. And this also touches on with what uh, Ilamosi had talked about, you know. Um, so if you are collecting this, type, let's say, for example, SEC in a particular country allows you to, or mandates you to collect this type of data. But then the central bank of that country also says you need to collect this other type of data. And then the data protection law in that same country says, oh, no, you cannot collect that data because it's against the privacy. So I feel like, you know, our agencies as well, and it's so funny that, you know, you mentioned this because similar thing is also happening in Kenya, whereby we have, a, we have data protection laws. And some of the things that we see from our central bank re as requirements contradict the data protection laws. So you're like, okay, can you guys go sit together and just talk? And then once you've, once you've agreed on what you want to do, come tell us now as operators, this is how we're going to move forward. So I think the biggest challenge has become, you know, data protection and data sharing and also data storage because it's the buzzword right now, if I may, if I may call it that way whereby every region, every regulator is trying to get into it, especially after GDPR happened, it really became a thing. Everyone was like, okay, we can also have our thing where we protect our, uh, our consumers. You know, we mandate that any player who's coming into our country needs to store data in a particular way, needs to do this, needs to collect this kind of data, especially when it comes to finances, you know, right? Um, you need to know who your customer is. You need to know where they live. You need to know where the money is coming from. All of these kind of things. And then in some data protection laws, they'll say, oh, no, you can't collect person, someone's location because there's this and this. And then there's the other aspect where as operators, we are trying to make it easy for our customers. So in some cases, instead of me asking a customer, tell me where you live, give me your address, I'll just ping the location through their phone. Like that could make it easier for them. But then again, there's data protection laws that go against that. And then there's the other aspect of customers are liars. And that's the whole truth. A customer can tell you that I'm living at this particular house. This is my address. And this is this. This is my name. And you know very well <laughs> that none of those teachers are actually correct. So I think that is, that is one of the biggest challenges that we actually face. And I just wish that... You know, we could be a bit more harmonized in terms of how we do data protection and data sharing within the country. It would make things so much easier because Africa in itself, African countries, um, honestly speaking, apart from the Nigerian market and Ethiopia, maybe, the rest of the African markets are pretty small. So it's not feasible for any company to just stay in one country and say, hey, I will prosper in this country and I'm good. How we are able to see progress is by expanding. And we've seen this a, a lot in the, within the fintech space, mm -hmm. whereby we're seeing a lot of startups actually have to expand, either Nigerian startups expanding into Kenya, Kenyan startups expanding into Ethiopia, into Nigeria as well, into the East African countries. That is how we measure our growth within the African continent because of how small our markets are. And that, that's a conversation for another day. So now imagine how much of a headache it is, you know, for Adedeji to probably expand his product from Nigeria all the way to Kenya. It literally has to kind of remake the whole process, have to start from the ground up and everything. So I just wish that things were actually easier in that sense. And then it should actually help us tackle this one problem of data sharing and data collection in respect to actually how we do digital ideas. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so Adidiji, I'd love your thoughts here as well. So what are the significant regulatory considerations that you think um, 
operators need to be on top of when dealing with digital identity systems in Africa? Oh, thanks. Okay, so, you know, uh, digital identity is kind of like uh, Lamas mentioned, it's kind of fragmented. So Africa, you have 55 countries, right? And if each of those 55 countries, you probably have at the minimum two type of ID system across. And, uh, but we have to be pragmatic about a few things, right? Uh, it's, there's never going to be a time when you have a national ID. Uh, Ilham said, let me break your heart. That's not going to happen. And reason being that uh, countries are always very, always extremely very uh, emotional and probably also realistic about ID. The guy that owns your ID owns your life. Uh, no country is ever going to hand over ID to any company to manage for them. That's also not going to happen. So when we put these pragmatic things at the back of our mind, then the next thing we we'll ask is then, so what then can we do? Uh, so for example, in Nigeria today, uh, in terms of ID, okay, there's national ID, there's BVN, there's voter's card, there's driver's license, there's international passport. All of them are all valid. That's like five. If you stroll into Kenya, you probably see a ton of that as well. Now, instead of trying to create a new type of ID and bringing companies forward to say, oh, I can do it better than the next guy, which is never like nobody's going to listen to you. I think the pragmatic thing they, that will happen will be companies by themselves or group of companies coming together to build a super ID on top of these IDs. That's the best way to move forward. That's the only way to, uh, to I would say, to is the least friction. Because, like I mentioned, nothing could happen. So, if I create a super ID on top of this, it means, for example, I'm in Nigeria, I could have an ID that identifies me as a person for real. And then I have my sub IDs, whether it's my BVN attached to it. If I also now happen to move to South Africa, I could tie my ID in South Africa to that. So, basically, if I then want to identify myself, I could start with that super ID and then the operator this time around could provide more ideas behind that to answer. But if you're expecting that one day a company will do that or African, or the African continent will answer. Because if you bring all the, um, uh, what do you call the uh, AU leaders and say, okay, we want to have single ID for Africa. So which countries standard are we going to use? That's like conversation for like two years. Always going to implement it, right? Is it going to be uh, my president's cousin that will do it? That's another three years. You could stay there for the next 20 years and it's never going to happen. So I feel this is more pragmatic now, but then that is also going to raise an issue where, let's say there are some companies that may probably never be able to pull that off. And almost you work at Meta, you can't pull that off because basically the regulators will come at you. So somebody will also do it and it's always going to be like some regulatory issue, this guy's too powerful and the rest of them. And then you also have underlying uh, rules and regulations. Uh, and laws that are kind of funny. So let me give you a typical example. A lot of Nigerians or a lot of Africans have dual nationality, right? So if any of your, irrespective of the ID, once somebody is an EU citizen, right? It can even be for citizenship, no, nobody cares. Automatically, you have to do things in line with GDPR, which becomes a problem for a lot of people. And I don't know how many African uh, identity providers that can operate they can operate at that level, but the significant burden is a lot. And by the time they try to pass that kind of cost to those who want to do the ID, it becomes another level of problem. As you speak right now, Meta, you don't have stress in EU because of the issues, right? It's you know, some part of uh, uh, open uh, chat GPT doesn't work in the EU because of data issues as well. These things are becoming a real problem. So those are my own thoughts. Uh, Thank you very much, um, Adidiji. So before I just um, ask my next question, I'll just um, just a reminder to everyone joining us in the chat room. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, please remember that you can ask your questions. You can just drop your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat room, in the Q&A box. And during the Q&A section, I'm going to take your questions and our speakers are going to answer them. Thank you. Um, Esigye. Um, how can technology be leveraged to solve the complexities around data sharing and data sovereignty within digital identity frameworks? Um, so, you know, 
it's a great question and and you know obviously technology should be leveraged and can be leveraged but i would actually pose um you know a different view on that and and i think um a lot of times we don't look at the non technology part of implementing technology right and so when you talk about you know data sharing um the problem we have is not technology the problem we have is regulation okay. right and you know the you can build to the technology right but you know a government coming together to say who are the authoritative sources of what types of data um how do we use the um the information to protect you know nigerian businesses how does it connect to our ndpr so everybody stays compliant you know um what is the end to end value chain of being able to use um all of this data um in many countries they have you know fraud reporting acts credit reporting acts you know different types of acts before and i think you know a lot of times you know when we talk about technology um we always want to jump to start talking about technology right and we don't really realize that before you start talking about technology you even need to understand the philosophy behind why you want to have the technology right and document and understand that um and see the regulation that you're going to put around that technology as stimulus right not as hurdles and challenges how do i put regulation to stimulate a local economy and protect my digital sovereignty at the same time these are really the conversations that we the government needs to be having so the government needs to be having non technological technology questions uh, so conversations right really for us to be successful and really stop particularly focusing on technology itself and then private sector can you know be be happy and feel confident investing in building technology because the government has put uh, proper regulation in place. Yeah, thank you CG CG, sorry. Um Ilamosi, what do you think about this? Do you think that there's any way we can use technology to solve um these complexities at the, around data sharing and data sovereignty? Unfortunately, I have to agree with SCG. Um, I think that there's sufficient technology. And if there isn't sufficient technology, technology will evolve to meet any cover any gaps that exist. What we have a problem with is regulation. Um, regulation is the most important thing. So if we could focus, because for example, now, if you wanted to transfer data, like I mentioned, is the regulations that are the problem. If you wanted to store data in a particular way, the regulations that are the problem. So it would be great if we could um, focus more on the regulation parts to ensure that data sharing is seamless um, for, for FinTech organizations and other financial organizations. Yeah. Um, so I want to stay on the topic of, um, so now I want to just pivot just a bit to, you know, we've been talking a lot about regulation and technology and all of that, but now I want to think about the people whose data we are collecting or whose data we're promising to protect and to not share. Now there is um, a question of, um, there's the issue of trust. Okay. People have to you know, when 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 we're talking about collecting people's um, data, trust is a big big issue. So now I want to understand, um, Ilamosi, what steps can be taken to build public trust in data sharing initiatives, particularly in regions where privacy concerns may be prevalent. Great, thank you for that question. I think that for, for users, the most important thing is that there's a lack of understanding. So there needs to be more transparency by companies and even by regulators that are trying to regulate or use their data. Users want to know what you're using their data for. If their data is safe with you, what you're doing to keep their data safe? What will happen if their data becomes unsafe? They want to know that you have everything covered. So a lot of there has to be a lot of transparency from companies and regulators, and there has to be a lot of education also, because if users are going to properly trust the system, they have to know exactly how the system works. For example, if you wanted to, there's something called, um, if you if you wanted to stop a, 
data processor from processing your data. There's something called automatic processing. If you use any means of technology to like AI, for example, to automatically process data, then you can object to that under various laws in Africa, right? And if you object to that, that means that whoever is processing your data, fintech or bank has to stop processing your data immediately. But if a user doesn't know that they have those rights, if they don't know that they can do that, if they don't know they have any redress mechanisms, then they're not going to trust the system because how do they complain? If they opt in, how can they opt out? So there has to be a lot of transparency. There has to be a lot of education. Transparency could also include your privacy policies. It would be great if um, financial institutions also had detailed privacy sections to show, okay, this is what we're doing with your data. This is how we're protecting your data. Um, our uh, security, cyber security, everything is up to date. If you have any question, FAQs are here. If people did that, if there was that sort of education and transparency, I think that users would not have a problem trusting institutions with their data. I think many people, particularly in Africa, just don't understand you know, what the data is, how you're using it, why you're storing it, and if it is safe. So I think those two things would really help. Yeah, great. Um, and so where can people go in terms of resources to learn about how their data is used, how it is shared, what rights they have in order to protect their data. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, unfortunately, in Africa, we don't have a lot of resources yet. So the, the primary places that people would want to go to get that information is the laws. You have to read the laws. You have to read the regulations. There are a few data protection blogs or technology blogs that carry um, um, articles on data protection. Whenever there's a new law out, they give you a summary of your rights and what the law says. Um, but there still needs to be more work around that because not everybody's going to want to read a full law. Not everybody's going to want to read a blog post. They need to be short, short, you know, short yeah. pictorial explanations just so that the everyday man who is scrolling maybe through Twitter or Instagram can understand what's going on in five seconds. If not everything, just on one specific topic, they can look at it and understand, okay, this is what they're doing with my data, move on. Maybe tomorrow something else comes in. So there needs to be more education. There needs to be more resources. As of now, the primary resources we have are the laws themselves and maybe any articles or blog posts explaining the laws themselves. Those are, those are, that's it, really. Thank you so much, um, Ilamosi, very eloquently put. Um, Saruni, um, so I'm curious about, you know, in terms of your experience in Kenya, so how can financial institutions ensure that data sharing initiatives are inclusive and accessible to underserved populations, including those in remote or low-income areas? Um, yeah, I think the easiest and most straightforward answer to that is data sharing. So, which of course has its own <laughs> has its own uh, issues uh, on the other end. But let's assume all of that is solved, and now we can share data well. So, I think the one thing that would be so there's this there's this thing that I actually um, last year when I was at MWC Kigali, um, MTN came on stage and they talked about how they had this idea of building a database and then building an API on top of this database. So the database was simply turning, you know, um, all the KYC data that they've collected as a telco into an API that would allow financial institutions to tap into it and hence just turning them essentially into an ID verification startup. And I thought this was a brilliant idea because one, um, they, the telcos themselves, and uh, we have Safaricom in Kenya as well, which is just as big as MTN uh, in some countries. Well, they do collect, I would say, a very enhanced KYC data. Because, for instance, for if you're to register a SIM card where it's required below in Kenya for you to actually register a SIM card physically, uh, it means I would go to a Safaricom shop, buy the SIM card, uh, I would present my national identity card or a passport, and then a photo of me would actually be taken. So mm -hmm. it's literally like a, a, a liveness check, but now in this case, it's physically. Um, so you can imagine they have this data whereby they know that Saruni actually exists. You know, it's not, Saruni is not someone else, not pretending to be someone else, Saruni is Saruni. So if they could turn this into a simple database that anyone else could actually, you know, uh, be able to, you know, do a quick API call just to verify, so you can imagine, for example, guys like uh, Verify Me, whereby there is the first level of verification where a user uploads their photo and uploads their ID. And then instead of having to go uh, and do uh, the check with the government database, where if cases like Nigeria and Kenya, where we actually do have government databases that we can verify with, that would actually work. But now imagine a country whereby we still don't have that. 
you get. So in this case, it would be very simple whereby they would tap into that kind of a database and be able to verify, okay, so what MTN has and what we have actually works, what Safaricom has and what we have do much. So we can actually say with, with some good confidence that this user actually is who they say. So I think um, to directly answer your question, the number one thing is that there needs to be communication in, and data sharing with, with this kind of, I would say, I don't want to call them government agencies themselves, but I also want to say like with the legacy uh, with the legacy telcos that do a lot of data collection in terms of ID and all of that, you know, if there was a way for them to share data with uh, operators and players like ourselves and other fintechs as well, it would definitely be more financial, more inclusive. Because in this case, let's let's actually just do a simple example for you to verify on an app like Flutter with Send App, right? Um, you want to you have to take a photo of yourself, you have to take a photo of your ID. What does that mean? You actually need to have a smartphone, right? And that is what a lot of their fintechs actually do. You know, they assume that, okay, we are going to target the people with the smartphones because rightfully so, when you look at the business side, that's where the money is. But then again, we are always going shouting, oh, when we are raising funds, we'll be like, oh, financial inclusion, you know, we're bringing more people on board. But the reality on the ground is we're just looking at a very small percentage. We're still leaving quite a lot of people out who are using uh, feature phones, which are still the majority type of mobile phone within the continent. And we've seen some startups come up with ways of saying, okay, we are gonna build a USSD wallet and all of that. But then again, there's still the issue of how do we verify? So here's an idea that I have. How about if we could have like a form of USSD verification, whereby I simply dial a USSD, put in my ID number. And because we have a partnership with a telco, let's say Safaricom in the Kenyan context. So we have a partnership with, with the telco. The telco would be able to pinpoint that, okay, this phone number is the one that has dialed this USSD and the, we have this ID. So we could potentially say, okay, we have the first layer of identification of who this person is. And then right now, because we also have mobile money, we, we do require you to put in a secure pin for to verify a mobile money uh, or rather to process a mobile money transaction. So the idea here is if we could also pin that same pin, which essentially should only be known to the owner of the phone. So pin it and let the owner actually put in the pin itself. And then now that would be like an added, like 2FA for USSD, whereby, oh, okay, so we have your ID and you put in your secure pin. So now we can assume that this is you. Of course, it's not 100% proof. It's just a raw idea. So there's people like, <laughs> you know, SCJ who will go build on top of such kind of ideas. Hey, I just want to say that we, we are providing that solution. So, I, you know, Corey, oh, we, <laughs> we, we do provide uh, USSD verification options, which, which rely yeah. on UFA uh, using phone yeah. number. Um, so, yeah. hey, everyone who's listening, go ahead and call us. We can help you. But thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, perfectly. Actually, I think that is it. That's the only thing I would say, because what we leave out is the USSD users. So we need to really yeah. think of them. And I would also talk to directly to any creators, any product guys, you know, anyone who's building any kind of startup. It doesn't have to be fintech. If you do require to have your users and free, and actually be, uh, be inclusive, I, I, I'm so obsessed with financial inclusivity, but being inclusive in any way, always remember to take care of your USSD users because those are the majority. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, and you very eloquently put. And thank you, Esigi, for um, signaling that um, that's a solution that you are working on. So this leads me to um, open finance and open banking. Um, Adedeji, your work is, you do very critical work in this space and so i'd like to know from you um what are the biggest concerns and challenges with building africa's open finance infrastructure and this is one area where um privacy is critical and people's um, suspicions are going to just go through the roof so talk to me about that yeah uh, thanks so much right uh, i i think for the biggest challenge i would say would be well, that's, it's not regulation. I think it's just uh, the industry and everybody not realizing how big this could be, how much problem it solves, right? And, and I will explain, you know, sometimes when you have small money, right, you're happy and then you just chill because you don't know that you could actually get a whole lot more. So mm -hmm. when you look at, uh, for example, when you look at Nigeria, that is very big with... Uh, payments right that all that didn't happen because identity wasn't done 
if every, if anybody knew payments in Nigeria could be this big before identity, maybe we are putting so much effort without having to wait for banks to have to build BVN for themselves, right? Now, that BVN kind of created the rule or removed the friction to allow a lot of things to happen. So when you talk about open banking or open finance, right, it's bigger than this. Probably we haven't scratched up to 1% of potential possibilities. And that because of that lack of understanding or the lack of the potential, right, not understanding the potential, there's a kind of apathy with different areas. So you see uh, banks on one side, they're just waiting for regulators, right? Regulators on the other side, maybe they have some other things to deal with, right? Because nobody understands the potential. And it's even interesting that even as slow as we think Nigeria's own is, right? The 53 other African countries are not even making any move at all. In fact, if you stroll into some other places and ask them about open anything, they're just looking at you like, what are you talking about? So if Nigeria that is supposed to be leading is still not there and the other countries are not moving, you can see how much money we are leaving on the table. But what, because what open banking does is it removes the friction. Everybody speaks the same language. So today we get on the web and we're browsing. What most people don't know is that before HTTP came around, uh, before we have common HTML and internet standards, we used to have AOL, we used to have Microsoft Online and some other legacy standalone networks that were doing the same thing that internet was doing. But because they weren't speaking to each other, right? That explosion, that ability for things to just quickly connect with each other and to explode, right, didn't happen at all. But once the internet came around and everybody was on the same standard, everything changed significantly. Now, what we open banking do, it's not like it's going to suddenly put money in people's pocket, but it's actually going to remove friction and it's going to increase velocity. Now, everybody that has, well, if you've been an engineer, you know fully well that once you remove friction and increase velocity, magic starts to happen. You know, then you're able to do a whole lot more. We talk about financial inclusion. It means anybody can easily open account for anybody, anytime. You could do your transactions. You could, you literally could do payment as a service. Um, 10 years ago, we used to talk about IoT, Internet of Things. Nobody talks about IoT anymore. You know why? Because IoT became so successful that you don't even care. Your doors have internet, your cameras have internet, your cars have internet, everything has internet. So Internet of Things. So what you're going to just app then is you're going to have payment of things. Payments will be embedded in every single thing. And this will be micro payment being paid for you're watching a movie for 10 minutes, you pay for those 10 minutes and you move on. You passing a toll, your car can instantly connect to the toll and make payment for the maybe the number of kilometers you've driven. Everything just going to be embedded because payment is like internet, is a fabric of the society. So I feel like this is a challenge, but I also know that it took years before the internet became a thing, right? Internet was invented in 19 like around between 69 and 72, as people start sending emails in 1972, this thing didn't become mainstream until like 20 years after. So maybe like early 90s. And then internet became a big deal, like 94, 95. So maybe it's going to take that long to for it to become a big deal. But once we get there, it becomes something we can stop. So we're talking about identity for a long time. Everybody, at least AC we know, how many attempts Nigeria made to do identity? Even a minister went to jail because of this identity issue. Then CBN came around and the bank, they created BBN. I remember when we started then, when BBN launched in October 2014, it wasn't having traction. See, the CBN government then called all the bank CEO and said, all the senior people in banks, if they don't do their BBN by a particular date, they're going to be fired. So all of us, we marched downstairs to our bank, you know, and we did it. Then. It became a thing, and today BBN is everywhere. Everybody struggles with it. So I feel like once we get, once somebody does it right, and we're almost there in Nigeria, and they say they promise, and they say everything working, then it's just going to become a thing. And when we start with open banking, which is just basically making, uh, allowing uh, customers to provide consent so that their data and their account can be controlled by other entities, People will just start taking that same concept and be adding telcos to it, adding the uh, capital market to it, insurance. You know, they keep doing all that. And one day we just look back and wonder, oh, why? What were we fretting about? But I think it's going to happen. Yeah. 
And, and that's very hopeful. And that's very hopeful to hear. Um, Isige, I'm just going to come to you with my very last question before I take the Q&A for the audience. So tomorrow is World Identity Day. Um, happy World Identity Day, everyone. Um, so can you highlight for me some of the broader societal and economic implications of establishing a legal identity for all individuals in Africa? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no. So um, for me, and I'll, let's take the economic one first, you know, and we've, we've talked a lot about the economic one. Um, so what does a legal identity do for us? Because, you know, when we say legal identity, all the things that are embedded in that are, you know, uh, AML compliance, um, all the general standards for you to have a certain amount of trust that that person is who they say they are. And from an economic perspective, you know, we think it's the first step to even uh, open finance. So as you look at that layer, it's really about identity, uh, payments, um, data as a science and uh, as a service. And of course, you know, uh, Deji talks a lot about lending, you know, which that's, you know, that um, layer of data as a, as a, as a, ser as a uh, service um, and really AI really unlocks. And when you now unlock that $120 billion uh, credit lending gap, right, that even DJ has written about, you know, this, these are really the steps to get there. So it's the foundation um, of, of, of what we're going to do um, to build any type of open economy for ourselves. And it also has security implications, you know, as well, you know, digital sovereignty implications. So that's, you know, that's just one aspect. And when you look at the social one, I really, really love it. And particularly on our end, because we really see the individual empowerment and individual self-determination aspect to it. Just for example, you know, um, rather than ask somebody for 10,000 naira for many people who are, you know, um, economically challenged, um, they can maybe get uh, a microcredit uh, loan for themselves. You know, they don't have to depend on people and ask for people because they have that digital identity now that they can be included in certain ecosystems for lending. You know, being able to get digital services, get their own phone, you know, without having to go to somebody to say, okay, you're my guarantor because this institution doesn't know me you know so there's really a a a, 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 a an individual self-empowerment to it um that i think is going to unlock a lot of other things for us um as we go into the future as well in africa and thank you so much um isige um so just as a quick reminder to um our wonderful audience in the chat room please um you can continue to um drop your questions in the Q and A box, not in the chat room, in the Q and A box, and I'll pick them and we'll discuss them before the session um, wraps up. So, um, so I have some questions here from that the audience um, has sent in, and also as another reminder, um, you're going to see a poll launched. So this is for our audience in the chat room. Um, you're going to see a poll launched on your screen. Um, please do well to answer the questions in the poll and also as we continue to have the Q&A you're going to also see a post event survey would like to know what you think about this event and how you feel and what you um, gained from it um, thank you very much um, so for the questions um, so now this is for everyone on the panel um, so what are the effects of the culture of secrecy in data collection and sharing? Um, I'm just going to begin with you, Ilamusi. I was still writing down the question. Sorry, what did you say? What are the effects of the culture the of secrecy? Yes. What are the data effects? And privacy? Exactly, exactly, yes. Well, um, practically speaking, I think that the biggest problem is that um, data um subjects falsify information i think that because of we need to protect themselves you know we have i was and i was writing i was doing some research on, on, on this very recently about how africa's um indigenous whether there was any data protection in africa basically before the laws came in and i was saying that i was i was i theorized rather that data protection in Africa used to be based on secrecy. People did not reveal things to other people that they felt were embarrassing. So yes, we're a communal, uh, we have a communal culture. Everybody should know as much as possible so they can help each other out. But if anything was considered to be embarrassing or shameful, people would typically conceal that. Um, in these days, that still happens. But I think that for, for banking specifically, if people think that information um, could be used against them or it's something that they want to keep private, like their address, for example, just like um, Sarumi mentioned, 
people might lie about that because they are thinking, oh, what if they come to my house? What's going to happen then? So I think that that's how the culture of secrecy merges with, with data protection and maybe banking and finance as we have it today. People lie just because they feel like the information, they conceal information because they feel like the information um, should not be made available to the people they are making it available to. They are concerned about the risks in revealing such information. And like I mentioned before, a lot of education, um, and awareness could change these mindsets. If we show them, look, nobody else is seeing this. This is for your own protection. This is for your own information. This is for, it's for you, basically. I think that we could change mindsets around that. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Yes, well, you have indeed. Um, Saruni, um, what are the effects of the culture of secrecy in data collection and sharing? Yeah, fun, funny that you should mention that because I thought this culture of secrecy was, was only in Kenya, but it seems like <laughs> it's an African thing. <laughs> Um, I, I think the biggest issue and challenge is that we are very skeptical and in terms of the skepticism goes in terms of I really don't trust the institution I'm giving my information to. So I'm going to give you an example and I hope this doesn't land me in trouble with my bank, but the address that my bank has is my old address. Yes, it was a real address, but it's my old address. And even after I change the address, I didn't even bother changing the address on the bank side. Not because I was trying to keep it a secret, but because I didn't see the importance of it. And that's the other aspect of it. You know, um, even when I'm not trying to keep something a secret, I still don't understand. And this, uh, this ties into what Ilamosi actually mentioned earlier on, whereby we lack a lot of education in terms of, okay, why is this data being collected? What's the benefit of this data being collected? So in this case, as someone who understands a bit of data privacy and a bit of why we need to collect this kind of data. I still don't see the benefit of the bank having my actual address today because, again, they've not communicated to me why they need that. So that ties in, as much as it's not really the secrecy part of it, that ties in to the current situation because now I'm acting as a customer, you know? I'm not an operator, I'm thinking as a customer. And there's many more of us, literally. There's so many people who would even go to the extent of writing the neighbor's address just because they're thinking, hmm, what if I give them this address and the day I default to my loan, they show up at my door, you know? So I'm not, I'm not going to give them my address. Well, there there you have the reason for them wanting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, I've, exactly changed, so. I've changed addresses twice and sometimes I'm never quite sure which address the bank has. And if uh -huh. people, I'm in the middle of a transaction, I'm like, which address is actually tied to my card? And I have to do some guesswork around that. Um. So this question is for you, um, Adideji. Um, so someone is asking, what do you think are the main reasons Nigerian banks are not adopting bank open banking faster and how can we change this? Oh, uh, okay. I think the problem is in with the Nigerian banks actually, because banks can't adopt open banking without regulation. Okay. Uh, so the issue is actually between maybe the industry and we just need to move faster. I'm talking about CBN, but they have a lot of things on their plates. Uh, if CBN comes tomorrow and says, let's, let's, let's start open banking tomorrow, the banks have nothing to do but to get ready. Now, but then in fairness to CBN as well, you have a lot to do, so you just have to prioritize. But I think we should do it faster. The banks are not the one delaying open banking because they can't, uh, no matter how much they like open banking, they can't implement it without CBN approval. Okay. Right. And someone wants to know um, what measures have, yes, what measures have been put in place to ensure that data processors don't tamper with critical customer data and trust, customer data entrusted in their hands. Um, Isigi, I'd love to hear from you here. Um, so, of course, you know, the measure the government has put in place is that we are licensed by, you know, uh, different government agencies, uh, depending on the um, the you know identity endpoints that we are um, providing to um, a private sector, and under those licenses, there's always regulation in terms of compliance, right, um, and use cases. So um, the first thing is, you know, as part of the regulation, generally, all your use cases include the individual request in a service. So there's no selling of data. Um, as you can see, they've, they've, in the past, there have been many fines by NITA um, for you know, some processor irregularities or maybe some misuse of data uh, by some you know, operators, maybe not even in my sector. Um, so and all you can do 
um, in most times is to um, have the proper regulation and the proper enforcement. Um, this is what's going to you know bring these cases to a minimum. But um, all over the world, every once in a while, or be maybe every twenty years, there might be an issue. Uh, but you know what I would say is you know the the government does try to put compliance in place. Now, of course, it's not perfect. Um, and we continue to engage. So, for example, with certain endpoints, you may have a proliferation uh, because you know more people have the access to the endpoints than they should. Um, so, what happens is, you know, you have a situation where you know um, government itself needs to tighten who has access to its data, um, and it's not even the risk may not be the data processes, um, but may actually just be who even has access to the main you know database and the main system in the first place. Um, and these are some of the things that need to be looked at. Yeah, thank you so much, um, CK. So I have this question from Anne Gital, and I'm going to split it between um, Saruni and Ilamosi. So. Africa has a diverse regulatory landscape when it comes to data protection and financial services. Could you share insights on best practices or potential harmonization efforts that can facilitate cross-border data sharing for the benefit of financial inclusion while respecting the sovereignty of individual nations? That was a long question. <laughs> So basically, how can we harmonize these um these regulations while respecting the sovereignty of um respective nations? Um, I can go first, but I feel like I've been doing that a lot. Sorry, do you want to go first? <laughs> I was actually going to say, let the expert go first. Because wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm happy to do that. Um, in terms of what is currently being done, I can off the top of my head name maybe two initiatives across the continent that, that are seeking to harmonize data protection laws. The first one is the Malabo Convention. Um, and the problem with this is that it is it is not binding upon the member states. It's, it's very suggestive. So you, and it's guiding principles, really. There are no strict like enforcement rules that, that governments have to follow. So they just say, oh, you should maybe try and do this. So if we're going to have the sort of harmonization we want, we need a regional document that is a bit stricter. Um, and the second thing I could I could point to is the AFCFTA. Um, I know that there are currently protocols being developed for cross border data um, flows, or I think that they have been developed already. But again, we have the same problem because of the sovereignty of these nations. Um, the documents are very loosely binding; they don't really impose obligations upon member states. So I think that going forward, if we really want to push for harmonization, unfortunately, there has to be international cooperation. States have to come to the table knowing that we have to do this to protect our citizens and we have to compromise on something. We have to reach an agreement. I think there has to be consensus on that. And then the agreement has to be reached. And because of our international law works, it has to be domesticated and implemented in the various states. So international cooperation is the only way forward, unfortunately. I think that what we can do as citizens, as people within the space is to, is to get in touch with um, regulators so whoever is regulating data protection in your country, I think she gets in touch with them. That's the first step, because if the regulator knows what to do, because that's their um, area of expertise, then they can communicate to the government, whoever is sitting at those tables, or if they're in the room themselves, they can communicate what needs to be done. So if the regulators have a good understanding of what the citizens' needs are, that can now be passed along up and up the chain until it gets to <laughs> the table where it needs to be discussed. So international cooperation, unfortunately, is, is, the, is the only way forward I see. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Lamosi. Um, Sarani, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll just say it in a different way because she said, you know, literally everything, and <laughs> I'll just say, yeah, we need to talk to each other. <laughs> That's literally the only way. Uh, all right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Adedeji, there's a question here for you, and it's from um Toby. Um, so it says, um, hi Adedeji, you mentioned what an open banking standard could do for Africa, like what HTTP did for the internet. Do you think current players in this space change or update APIs too frequently? No, I don't think they operate too frequently. And I feel like since the standard is hasn't been built, people haven't actually seen what it's going to do. Mm. Right. But when it comes, it becomes like the way you do uh proper internet RFC standards. Nobody changes 
uh, internet ratify standards anyhow, right? Usually it goes through ratification, takes like a couple of years, and it means that a lot of people uh, come to the table and look at things from different point of view. When that is done, all the uh, local and legacy and proprietary standards we all disappear. Nobody will use that anymore, right? So that's what's going to happen then. And what it means for you, either as a, as a startup, as a developer, as a product person, means that if you build a product in Nigeria or you build a product in, let's say, Ethiopia, for example, using type of APIs, when you get to Zambia, it's probably going to work. Now, of course, obviously, there may be different business rules and local regulations that may affect how the product works. But from a technical point of view, it's always going to be, that will not be your problem anymore. So today, if I'm building a website, I'm not worried about what browser somebody is using in Ethiopia, right? Or in uh, Western Sahara, because I know that as long as you're using a browser, they're going to see my website. But it doesn't mean you sign up for my product, but at least that problem isn't something that is bothering me. And that's what open banking and open finance will be. So it means that even though the fact that you built your application on open banking standard, it doesn't mean that if uh, Lamosi comes, for example, and she shows up in another country, she will be allowed to open an account because the laws there may not allow her to do that. But technically, the application will work. Thank you very much, Adidiji. Um, Saruni, I'm going to come to you with this question. Um, so how do we, so this is about debt recovery because you talked about banks knowing your address. So I, I feel like you're going to have a lot of insight into this um, question. So it says that how do we infuse data sharing as a means to reduce the stigma of unethical debt recovery? And um, the person goes on to say that to say that we have seen posts online where recovery agents representing lenders harass customers who have defaulted in paying back their loans. So basically, while people are sharing their data, they're also worried about how it can be used to um, harass and attack them if they are defaulting on their loans. So how do we um, control for that or how do we assuage people's fears around this? Yeah, so first of all, to clear out any assumptions, I've never run away with anyone's money, including <laughs> the bank. <laughs> so the reason why I need to update my address, but yeah, to answer that, yeah, um, this is definitely a behavior that we've also seen in Kenya. And actually, it was the first mandate that our data protection agency actually came in and tried to basically, you know, Kane, I will actually use the word Kane. Kane, the perpetrators, because we've seen lots and lots of complaints. Either they are uh, accessing your contact list and then uh, calling random people or texting random people in your contact list, asking them to tell you to pay your debt, shaming you on social media, going to the extent of just doing some unscrupulous methods just to try and do debt collection. So I think in this case, um, Instead of going, instead of looking at it from the consumer side, I think it's up to, you know, um, the player's side to actually behave in an orthodox, orthodox manner and not try and, you know, do some very weird things and crazy things, if I may call them that, just to try and get back a few coins here and there. So I'll give you an example. I've seen a screenshot of someone who was claiming that they had received over 200 calls from a debt collector for some, on behalf of someone else. So it's not their debt, it's on behalf of someone else and threatening messages as well. Now the debt collector is now threatening them that they will do things to them on behalf of this person unless they tell this other person to pay. And all of this was for an amount that was, I think, 1,600 Kenya shillings, which translates to around $10. Right now, with today's exchange rate, so ten, twelve dollars. So you can imagine going through all those, <laughs> all that, just for such kind of an amount. So I think in this case, for the Kenyan context, the regulator did come in to try and bring sanity into the space. So in terms of the players, in this case, I think it's the players who actually need to behave themselves. You know, there's better ways for us to be able to collect debt. You know, uh, when you're even doing credit scoring, make sure that wherever you're credit scoring, you are able to take the risk and know that, okay, pass on X, I'm going to give them X amount of credit and there's chances, you know, always give it a 50-50 chance. There's chances that this person will decide to, you know, deep with my money, there's another chance that they may decide to pay. And when, they, when even when they don't pay, I think we can also 
also employ some methods that are not discriminating because these discriminatory methods are what now make consumers become smart. So the next time this person was discriminated, when they're taking another different loan or applying for credit, they're probably not going to use correct data. They're, not pro they're probably not going to give the correct address or the correct phone number. So it's a two-edged sword, but I think on the first, uh, the first side, it's the players who actually need to behave themselves and come up with better debt collection methods. And then the customer will also act accordingly. Thank you very if much. If I can add just one one thing to that, you know, I just I just want to say, you know, and you know, I think some of these cases are extreme. Um, of course, like you mentioned, Surumi, I mean, really harassing the guarantor. <laughs> but let me tell you this, right? Is that also private sector is put in a very, very tough situation, right? There is no, no regulation. So you can literally take a loan, right? Um, not pay, right? And the enforcement, right, after you don't pay in terms of and what the government has put in place for, for it to be reported is so mediocre, right? And then the fact that you now have multiple types of ID where you can basically take one loan on your NIN and one on your BVN makes it even more difficult. This is why harmonization is important, right? So it's almost like the industry, right, has been left on their own to resolve their own credit, their own collection problems, right? So, and it happens everywhere, right? So for example, even the landlord tenant, um, even the, the job in many, in many places, you know, you're required to do a background check. And just even going to an example of, oh, why should I give my address? I just want to say, right, everywhere around the world is not just in Africa. People generally don't give the right information unless there's enforcement. But I can tell you that most countries, right, if you get a letter from the court, right, first of all, and it's a fee and it doubles, right, basically, if you have not changed your address, this is by regulation with your local MVA, right? In 30 days, it's even illegal not to do it in 30 days. It's your problem. If you get a ticket and that ticket goes from 50 pounds or hundred dollars and goes to $500 because of interest and they've been sending you at your um, at an old address, you haven't changed it. When you go to court, the judge, it's your fault for not changing your address. And we, we never look at regulation for the long game, right? To make, to, to establish what happens in private sector. And a lot of this is because of the lack of regulation and lack of putting proper things in place, right? Um, so that people, we can collect proper information, I think also. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I agree very much, Isige. Um, just as a reminder, um, you're going to, see, for those of us joining in the chat room, you're going to see um, a survey in the chat room. Please um, do fill the survey so that we know how you feel about this um, panel. Right. Um, so I'm just going to ask one more, one last question, Isige. Is there a world in which we can have identity verification without KYC? Someone someone wants to know. Well, I mean, uh, uh, identity verification is one of the aspects of KYC, right? But, you know, when you look at KYC, KYC unlocks many things, um, mm -hmm. you know, but it's not just about knowing, you know, who somebody is, it's about knowing what, what they are and where they are. Um, the way I see it potentially in the future, it could go two ways, is that, Identity is kind of embedded, right? And the real important information is the analytics. What other information can you have about the person to give them uh, much more valuable services? Um, and then the second way it can go actually is a kind of like the decentralized identity, right? Where um, you use blockchain or like what, um, you know, Deji said in terms of building a kind of private sector unified ID on top of um, a government, you know, ID infrastructure. Um, so it could go, it could go one of those ways. But in terms of, you know, no, no country, I don't think is going to uh, relinquish their opportunity to uh, be the authoritative source of identity for their people, right? So is that going away? Um, no, but it could take on different forms, um, embedded, um, included in uh, decentralized finance, or you know, built on top. You know, we could see some of those different types of options. Thank you very much. Um, so we've come to the end of the Q&A session, we, section, which means that um, the um, the panel is gradually winding to a close. So just before we do um, the last or the final things in our housekeeping, 
I just want to hear from everyone on the panel. Um, what are your final thoughts on the subject? So we've discussed extensively um, the issue of data sharing, data capture, um, privacy concerns, regulatory um, fragmentation, and all of the issues that have, you know, all of the problems that have cropped up due to all of these. And so I'd just like to hear from each and every one of you what your final thoughts on this are in terms of where we are and where we should be just quite quickly. Um, so I'm going to begin with uh, Sarini. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so first, I'll just say thank you so much to the Takeable team <laughs> for having us. Yeah. And really, it's been, honestly, it's been really an exciting conversation to have and very insightful. So on my part, I will be speaking to the fintech players and fintech operators mm -hmm. and saying that we need to stop working in silos. You know, while we have expectations for regulators and government and saying, hey, you need to put in the frameworks and everything, and where we are saying we need a unified, you know, uh, regulatory framework, especially for data sharing. All that will not happen if there's no one to push for that. And the, the first group of people who would actually push for this is the printed players themselves, because this benefits all of us. So the call here is we need to stop working in silos. We need to stop acting as if we are enemies of each other. You know, that this fintech and this fintech, just because we are, com we are competing for the same customer base, then we should not talk to each other. Because imagine in a world whereby we had good practices, whereby we were sharing, uh, of course, with the permission of our customers, we were sharing data with each other in the right way. And we were coming together to fight for you Unified, you know, uh, regulations and regulations that benefit the whole industry. So my call is to all fintech players that we need to actually come together and work as one and stop operating in silos and seeing each other as enemies all the time. In some cases, coming together helps us. In some cases, of course, hiding your next move is also a good thing. And um, thank you very much, um, Saruni. So just before I go to everyone else, before I before I come to you, Esige, Adedeji, and um, Ilamusi, about your final remarks, I'll ju we'll just quickly cue in Ngonya Kalango, who has a brief presentation for us from Core ID, and then we'll continue with the final remarks. Good afternoon, yeah. everyone. My name is Ngonya Kalango. Um, I'm the head of sales here at Core ID. Um, so I just came in to give closing remarks while we just um, share some of our slides. Um, with you. Um, this has really been a fantastic show, I must say. Um, it's been highly engaging. Um, before we just, you know, go into everything, I'd just like to take this opportunity to um, thank our audience for joining us today and for their engagement throughout the session. Um, we hope that they have found it insightful and um, also enjoyable. Um, Thank you to our esteemed panelists for sharing um, your expertise with us. Um, your contributions have been invaluable. Um, I believe we've all gained great knowledge on data sharing and financial inclusion. So um, I would love to keep the conversation going with our audience members. Um, I want to demonstrate how um, you can harness core ID solutions to streamline your onboarding and compliance processes. Our solutions, um, or our range of products, should I say, they go beyond identity. Um, so we support customer profiling, digital addressing, fraud prevention, um, and much, much more. Really, um, the possibilities on what you can do with our platform is really endless. Um, we're really excited to engage with um, you all one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we're happy to provide you with more information on our solutions and um, to discuss the multiple benefits um, our solutions can offer you. Um, to schedule a demo with us, please visit us at www.coid.com. Um, you can also reach out to us over email via sales at coid.com or contact at coid.com. We will drop all this information down in the chat as well, just so that you can have that available to you at a glance. And um, lastly, before I all let you go, I'd also like to thank the Tech Cabal team. Um, they have been a consistent partner on this Inside Identity series over the years. Um, your dedication and expertise have greatly contributed to the success of this initiative. Um, we look forward to continued success, you know, on this series with you. So uh, thank you everyone for your time. I look forward to speaking to you all on Core ID and how awesome we are. And of course, to hosting you on the next edition of Inside Identity. 
So enjoy the rest of your day and um, back over to you, Kelechi. Thank you very much, Ngonya. Thank you so much for um, the wonderful presentation. Um, enjoy the rest of your day too. So we're just going to continue with the closing remarks, um, Ilamusi. <laughs> You're muted, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you to the panelists. It was a lovely conversation. And also thank you, Kelechi. Um, and thank you to the Tech About Team generally. For final remarks, I'm going to say two things. First, to echo what Sarini said, um, but in different language. Um, we need harmonization. It's absolutely crucial for, for the growth of the financial sector, as well as many other sectors that rely on data. The second thing I want to say um, is to is to the, the financial companies or institutions who are building these products and solutions that we're seeing. I think the one thing I want to say is that they should build privacy into their products from the beginning, because often we see that privacy is a final consideration after the product is done. So I would say that they should build privacy into their products or consider privacy when they are building their products so that, I mean, the ecosystem we're trying to create is, is something that eventually comes to fruition. That's it for me. Thank you very much, um, Ilamosi Adidiji. Final thoughts. Yeah, so for me, uh, I, I think I detail is critical and I know that it's going to unlock uh, prosperity in Africa because it will remove the friction by allowing people to uh, work on being able to access services easily Right. Um, my take would just be like, um, well, pushing this back to AC and um, people similar to him to instead of fighting to, you know, take over this thing. Okay, AC doesn't believe in that, but take over countries and uh, identity, create smart ways to aggregate this thing and make it available in a very simple way. You know, so if I come to AC, you should be able to find a way to digitally know me and know which of the underlying ID. Will be, will be able to work. That would be a faster way to work because working with government and working to change to prove to people that, oh, I can hold the ID, is going to be a tough sell. So I, I prefer a more practical solution. And when it comes to open banking, I know it's, been, you know, I'm, I don't think anybody's waiting for this thing much more than, I've been on this thing for six years. I'll just say, maybe one more year will be there. And then after a while, we'll forget. It's just like the train that is running in Lagos, finally running after waiting for, 15 years for it. One day it's all going to be history and Africa will have a more prosperous outcome for itself. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, we really, we really do hope so. Um Isigye. Uh thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh this was also, you know, for me uh, a enlightening conversation. Um the, the first thing, you know, for us at Core ID is that, you know, um, it we would love for the uh, the fintech ecosystem to uh, engage and have conversations with us. Um, while there's a lot of work to do, um, there are so many products in, in the fraud space um, and in terms of data sharing. In fact, um, some of us local operators are now sharing data, uh, you know, so there's more advancement than we're aware of. Um, but it's also, you know, good for us to um, have the takeaway um, that we con need to continue to be advocates um, in terms of and seeing our government as partners um, and understanding that, you know, the regulation is there for us um, uh, because at the end of the day, it's our country. Um, it's not really the government's country. It's our country. Um, and so we have a right to participate um, and help shape future regulation. And, I, and it's something that we all really need to understand. Thank you so much, Isige. And of course, we are the government, so it's all our country. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Saroni. Thank you, Isige. Thank you, Adedeji. Thank you, Lamosi. Thank you, especially Lamosi, for accepting our invitation very very last minute um you just came on just last just yesterday evening and came so prepared and everything and this was so enlightening this was so um interesting all around everyone shared um their thoughts and their knowledge and our and their insight with our audience and thank you so much for your time um we do not take this for granted um i just want to quickly um just remind our audience to please Feel our post event survey. Um, tell us what you think. Tell us how you feel about the Inside Identity um, series. Um, would love to hear from you. And just as a final reminder, that this um, conversation 
was brought to you by Tech Cabal Insights and um, Core Ident Core ID. Um, Core ID is a Core ID is a digital identity platform that makes it easier for businesses to connect to trusted identities and critical consumer analytics. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and your experience with me and with our audience and our participants in the chat room. Thank you, Eniola Sochon, who moderated the chat room, and Bright, who was on the social media end of things. And also just remind, just um to note everyone that TC Insights or Tech Cabal Insights is Tech Cabal's data research and intelligence unit, which provides actionable insights on, on actionable data rather on startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa to investors, entrepreneurs, big tech companies, regulators, and other players on and off the continent. So um if you want to talk to us about anything involving data around startups and around the tech ecosystem, actionable data, please um, talk to Tech Cabal Insights. Also subscribe to our daily newsletter, TC Daily, which is a daily roundup of the most important tech news in the ecosystem every day. Um, thanks everyone again for your time and See you around, see you in the near future. Talk to you again soon. I hope that if we invite you, Ilamosi, Adedeji, um, Isigi, and Sarani, if we invite you again to talk to us about anything, data, or any other topics you're experts in, I hope you say yes to us. Thank sure. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Chen. Bye, everyone.